Hi everyone, this is Chetan Nayak. This video is a full demonstration of the various capabilities that reside within Brute Retail. This might not cover all the topics and there are a lot of videos which cover other topics which are already uploaded to the YouTube channel. However, this video will focus on a brief demonstration of an active kill chain. Uh, everything starting from getting an initial access to moving laterally to a domain environment uh, to a domain controller and uh, finally escalating a privilege and uh, pivoting to other systems. So by default, when you download Brutal for the first time, this is what the package would look like. You have the adaptive C2 package over here, which contains a sample of external C2 channels that you can use. Currently, the only sample is of Slack, but you can take that example and build your own with the adaptive C2 Python file and the C file that we have. There's the ad hoc scripts directory which contain various other scripts such as generating new self-signed certificates, installing any dependencies if you require. Most of the time the dependencies uh, are not required, it should directly work out of the box. But however, if you don't have that, then you can use that script to install it. A notification script of Python which can be used to forward your um, initial connection information from your payloads to a Slack or Discord or anywhere else. Then you have a shell code loader samples directory which provide you various options to build your own uh, shell code loaders over here. Remember that this is just an example here and you're not supposed to be using this directly, but you can test out the shell codes of Brute Retail using this uh, C file that you have. And you can write your own in case and understand how the shell codes would work in that case. There's also a PDF file which provides you various options on the API calls of Brute Retail, how to execute commands and a lot of other things. We won't be getting into that right now, but if you are someone who likes automation, you can really um, use that specific PDF file, which can be really handy. So right now we will download, uh, we have already uh, downloaded the latest package that we have. When you execute it for the first time, you will be able to see the version and two options as to how you want to execute the package. The first option is the hyphen retail option. The hyphen retail option that you have over here, it can help you to start a server. The hyphen update option that we have over here can be used to update an existing Brutal server package that you might have. So over here, I'll type, let's say, I'll first start um, a standalone server and I'll show you how we can actually uh, do the whole thing autom in an automated way as well. Hyphen A admin, hyphen P, uh, let's say password, SC for cert, SK for key, both of which are directly compatible with Let's Encrypt hyphen H to start your handler. This is where your graphical user interface would connect back and enter. And you can see a random key is generated, which will be used to encrypt your post request data inside your malleable uh, profile that you might have configured. I'll execute commander over here, which is a C++ tool. And this is how the UI would look like. So by default, all your server configurations would go into this specific place that we have over here. Currently, we don't have anything, so it's pretty much empty. All of the uh, documentation required for this are uh, there on the brutal.com website itself for every information on the uh, profiling package that you see here. Currently, we'll quickly add a new listener. We can add a HTTP listener. And you can see we have various options to add an HTTP listener. I'll name it as, let's say, JSON C2. The listener bind host, I'll use my internal IP address. Normally, depending upon whether you are on AWS, DigitalOcean, you might be able to see one or the other. The rotational host over here, you can specify as many rotational hosts separated by a comma here. You can specify multiple domains, multiple redirectors, uh, over here, multiple IP addresses, anything that you require. I'll just select same. The port, user agent over here, the header, let's say I'll type content let's say hyphen type application slash json uh, the post request this is how your post request would look like when the payload or what we call as badges over here when the badges send the data to the server so i'll create a very simple json request let's say channel and i'll create a response as well over here so that when your server sends a response back it will send it within this malleable response that we have and then you also have an option over here as to what the server should send if it doesn't have any response to send back. So I'll just create a simple response here as well, as simple as this. 
info ok over here perfect so what this means is that this is where your payloads encrypted request would go and it would basically be sent out to your post request inside this malleable profile the server will respond back by adding its encrypted data inside this malleable uh, response that you have and if it doesn't have any response to send instead of just sending an empty response it will simply just go and send this inside send a uh, empty response so whenever your payload connects back and your command uh, your command and control does not have any commands to return it to it will send it this response to the payload the uri you can specify as many uris as you require content.php let's say admin dot php question mark let's say test equals to abc anything that you require over here nothing fancy os your ssl option over here any internal proxy you might have and then you have your sleep masking mechanism this sleep masking mechanism that you have is responsible for encrypting your heap your stack your rx regions spoofing your stack region whenever it goes to sleep and a lot of other things you have the asynchronous procedure call or two thread pooling mechanisms which are totally different from each other i'll select let's say pooling zero i'll set it to one set it to zero and now you have an option for a one-time auth or a common auth the difference between these two are that uh, a lot of times when i was doing uh, my earlier engagements with cobalt strike i faced an issue where if the blue team cap, uh, gets a hold of your payload the blue team can execute the payload late let's say maybe 100 times or 200 times into a sandbox and you will end up having that many beacons on your user interface i wanted to avoid that altogether so i added an option over here of one time auth and a common auth so let's say you're doing a phishing activity and you want to fish five people you can either add the five unique authentication keys here or let the server randomly create five for you once that has been done the unique authentication keys the next thing what you can do is basically you can just create a payload out of those five keys that have been generated those five keys will be embedded inside your payload and whenever the payload connects to the server it will send that key in an encrypted context inside your malleable profile that you have over here once that has been sent out to the server the server will extract your malleable uh, your data from the malleable request decrypt it validate if the key is correct if the key is correct it will send back a token in response which the payload will then use to authenticate continuously with the server like any other web application but however let's say if your payload is killed and executed again that key which was initially sent to the server that would have been deleted on the server's end so the same payload will not be able to connect back in case you use a one time auth in case of a common auth however the key is not removed from the server it will stay persistent and unless you until you kill the server in this case or you change the authentication key from the listener itself and in that case the key will stay persistent and the same payload will be able to connect back over and over again i'll select this for time being to show you how this works and if i click on this icon you will be able to see the whole listener configuration now whenever you see this listener configuration one thing to remember is that unlike cobalt strike where you just create a listener and you can create various payloads out of it over here in case of root retail things are a bit different whenever you generate a listener profile a payload profile will be automatically generated now this profile can be used to either generate payloads over here or it can also be edited over here or you can also add your own custom payload profiles into brute retail you can also let's say uh, add multiple http profiles and change the configuration of your existing payload over here by right clicking and changing the configuration or the malleable profile on the fly without having to inject a, 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 your code into a new process or drop any executable onto disk in this case so right now what i will do is i'll use the staging option i'll enable stager i'll set to let uh, i'll just configure it for one stage which means after downloading one stage it will automatically stop as you can see the configuration over here you can also see the five unique authentication keys which it automatically generated and i will create a simple stage over here in this case now remember that in case of staging you see only two options x64 and x86 and how it should simply exit whether it should be return or anything else in this case in case of your stageless payload you have a default and a stealth option so by default all staging payloads that you have they will by default be in the stealth format now the difference between them is that both your default and stealth payloads will use rob gadgets to hide itself from ETWTI. they will still use indirect syscalls and a lot of other ways which i have described in my v1.1 v0.8 and v0.9 blocks in this case however if i select let's say the stealth option it will also unhook the edr from any dlls that have been loaded which means if there are any type of user land hooks in this case for example there are any jump instructions in the nt api call which the user land 
deal of the EDR has hooked, they will basically be uh, uh, unhooked in that case for every DLL that the EDR has hooked. This can be your NTDLL, uh, Win32, sorry, WinINET.DLL, WS2 underscore 32 or a lot more. So right now I will just create, uh, let's say, a staged payload over here. This should be as small as around, I think, around uh, 9 kilobytes. Perfect. I'll go back to my documents directory that I have here. And I'll just type, I have a very simple script called as bincompile.sh, which simply takes our shellcode file that we have provided, converts that to hex dump, converts that to a simple executable uh, using virtual lock, virtual protect, and executes it. Nothing fancy as you can see here. So I'll just type 64 stage underscore at dot bin and stage dot exe. We'll go back. We have a domain environment here and we will execute this stage over here. My system is a bit slow, so just bear with me. We should have our stage here. Perfect. Let's see if we can get a connection back here. We should also get a notification here that a stage, as you can see, that the stage was authenticated. The authentication key that was used by the stage was removed and the initial access was provided and this token was provided in return. And you can see we have a new connection over here so you can type any commands that you require and get a response back in this case. This is how the staging would work. Now if I go back to watch list and click on this icon, you can see that the uh, two keys have disappeared. There are only three keys now and the staging is now zero which means if the same stage is executed it won't be able to connect back to anything in this case. And if you take a look at the authentication keys, uh, instead of five, there are only two because the first key was used up by your stage and the second key was used up by the stage that was executed by your stage in this case. So if I, let's say, exit this over here, if I go back and execute this again, you can see we have an access denied here. I can go to server, take a look at the logs here, and you can see we should have a dauth log. I click on view and you can see that this key was used to authenticate and it tried to communicate to this URI using this configuration and the access was denied in this case. Which means there is uh, basically, uh, it was basically access denied and this is an invalid payload. If you want to change the listener key, you can simply copy this key, go over here uh, and uh, click on change authentication, add that over here. And now when you take a look at the authentication, the key would have been added up over here. If you want to add multiple keys, you can add them in a comma separated value as well if required. But however, this is a quick overview of how you can uh, create everything. Now let's say, uh, let me go back and actually kill this uh, over here if it's not already exited. Let me see, uh, stage, yeah, it's already exited, perfect. So now what we will do is, a lot of times there might be scenario where you might want to kill the listener and uh, kill the server to make any some changes or update the server without having to lose your uh, payloads that you have over here in this case. In that case, you can simply just type control C. By default, an auto save dot profile will be created over here, which will contain your whole server configuration as can be seen. So I can simply type over here instead of this whole command line argument set, you can type hyphen R auto save dot profile. And you can see that your listener and everything was automatically restored in this specific case. So if I connect back, you can see your information, your badger, which is basically dead over here, your listener configuration and anything else, including your payload profiles over here and other information. However, let's say, let me show you how this can be done in a better way because currently we saw how we can start everything from scratch, but a lot of times you might want to automate this whole process. So let's see how we can actually uh, use a payload profile or basically your C2 profile instead of using your, uh, uh, instead of starting everything from scratch in this case. So let's go back. I'll type brute retail Linux 64 hyphen. And before I do anything, I'll let me go back to my server conf directory. There is a very simple HTTP profile. Nothing fancy as you can see. Uh, we have our admin username and password which will be used to start the team server. A set of click scripts over here. Where you, wherein you can add multiple commands inside a specific script name. So whenever you execute this script name from the graphical user interface, 
it will execute whatever commands are inside that something that can be used to automate a bunch of commands uh, whenever you want to execute any auto runs that you want to execute automatically whenever the payload connects for the first time you can see all of this is in json itself unlike cobal strike which uses its own sleep language yeah the c2 handler the com encryption key which will be used to encrypt your post request any previously breached credentials that you might have which you want to convert to windows tokens the listener information over here in this case so you can take a look at the append the append response this is for the request this is for the response over here the empty response any extra headers over here that you might want to add these are just garbage uh, headers that i've added but you can add anything that you require over here and a few more other information if you're using a fronted domain then this case might be this might be your uh, actual sorry this the host value might be your actual fronted domain like xyz.azurex.net or anything that you might use with fastly or stack path in this case uh, you also have your SMB configurations over here, SMB and TCP payloads. Remember that whatever you're seeing over here from the GUI, from the CLI, can also be done from the GUI as well. The PSXD configuration for your service executables, your SSL key information, your BOFs, if you have written your own custom BOF, you can register them as an internal command of Brutator. So whenever I execute this command in the console, it will automatically execute this object file that you have over here. And it's help information as you see here. Similarly, uh, Brutal also provides you two ways to execute c -sharp code. One is by loading a c -sharp executable into a target process, which can be executed via a tool called as, uh, via a command called as sharp reflect. And this register P is just a wrapper for the sharp reflect itself. So this will create a new process of basically inject your uh, c -sharp shell code into the target process and give you a response back. You also have the c register P in line. In which case it simply uh, executes a process into the current process itself, sorry, a, a C sharp executable into the current process, which is a wrapper for sharp inline command. It will run that and give you a response back. You also have a reflect UDL, which is a wrapper for your load R command, and a webhook option if you want to forward your initial access request or your uh, all of your badger's output to maybe an Elk server or a, stack or a Slack channel or somewhere else to get notifications or anything else in this specific case. So I'll go back and I'll start my Rotel server over here with hyphen C server con fetch TP profile. Ah, my bad. I already have the previous autosave profile here, so I can either remove it over here or type hyphen F as you can see here. Uh, yeah, with the hyphen F option to overwrite it. So I'll just remove it for now. And you can see that my uh, listener has been started. Listener, the whole server and everything. So let me go back, connect to the server. And you can see that I have my listeners over here. I should have my auto runs configured over here in this case, as you can see, to set the child process for fork and run. The payload profile information over here, as can be seen for SMB, TCP, and your HTTP over here, which can also be modified. And I will simply create a staged payload here. Uh, this is a, sorry, a stageless payload, my bad. I'll save it here. It's a 245 odd kilobyte shell code. And instead of this, I'll type, let's say, uh, let me see what other exes are there in my current directory. Let me remove them and let me compile this as badger.exe, for example. And what I will also do is I'll create a Metasploit shellcode to show you how um, other C2s would look like, either Metasploit or if you use Cobal Strike. Cobalt Strike also uses the same wrapper as that of Metasploit in this case. So the whole uh, core should basically be similar in this case. And by the time it starts, I'll start Metasploit console as well. I will go back and get my shell till they are generated. So you can see I have a badger.exe. Let's see if we can get a new connection back here. Perfect. And yeah, I did not erase the uh, uh, logs of my previous one. So it's still showing up over here. So if you want to erase these information, you can just actually go here to the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, current directory. And you can simply remove the logs, uh, basically information over here, such as, let's say, uh, my bad, slash 09. Uh, sorry, what's the name of the log? I think it's uh, B0. Yeah, B0.log. Yes, and yeah, it's running as an administrator, my bad. And now if I open this one, this should basically be empty over here. As you can see, because that was the log which was 
being generated. If I execute any command, you can see that it has been executed and gives me a response back. And now uh, my Metasploit has also been generated. So I'll use exploit multi-handler, set payload, set L host over here and run. And now I'll execute both these shell codes. The one shell code that I have over here, that's going to be uh, this one and the Metasploit one as well. I can enumerate processes using the ps command. So I'll type ps. You can see it gives me various options. I can search for let's say explorer here or you can type ps grep explorer and it will search that up for you. I'll set that as my parent process 6272 or I can also actually right click my payload and search for processes directly from the GUI as well. I can search let's say explorer. You can also search on the basis of let's say the PID let's say 62 over here. It will show you every PID that has 62 or in the uh, basically the string as well. I will close this up and right now we have set this as parent. What I'll do is I'll uh, run two processes run notepad and run notepad again because I'll be injecting uh, the shellcode of my brutal in one and on the other I'll be injecting the shellcode of Metasploit and I will go ahead and change my uh, thread injection and memory injection techniques sorry thread uh, injection and memory allocation unlike cobalt strike where you have to kill the server and start everything again in case of brutal you can simply just modify it on the fly so I'll type set malloc four that's my memory allocation technique over here and I'll type set thread X over here that is going to be a thread execution technique I'll select let's say nine and now I will type sh inject X space the first PID which is 3060 space the path of my badger shell code so I'll type let's say uh, this executable I should get a new connection back over here from notepad.exe and I will also execute Metasploit's shellcode as well into the secondary uh, process the name of which was MSF and I should get a connection over here from Metasploit perfect. Now let's see what both of them look like over here. So let me search for let's say notepad and let me stack the information about both of them. So now let's talk about a bit about um, evasion. When you're using Metasploit or Cobalt Strike, it does not spoof its start address. Unlike over here on the right hand side where you can see, Brutal does not have any suspicious start addresses over here unlike this one. Because BRC4 will automatically hide its own start address whenever it is simply uh, executed. The secondary thing over here is that if you can take a look at this, I'll execute, exit the previous payload. I'll go on to the new one and you can see that the thread ID is 5636 which you can see here and you can see that the entry point over here or basically the whole stack is itself spoofed similar to any other stack that is currently there over here in this specific case because unlike your cobalt, uh, cobalt strike or your metasploits payload which basically has shell codes over here and this shell code these are basically not the shell code but basically any data that has been pushed to stack and since this thread does not start from uh, does not originate from disk whereas it is only from in memory the entry point is 0x0 and it also has a lot of data that is from stack and it does not have a valid stack frame unlike in the case of brute turtle over here which spoofs its stack frame whenever it goes to sleep so if i go to 5636 you should be able to see its stack frame which always which should always start from rtl user thread start as in the case of any other legitimate thread as well Apart from this, if you go to the memory sections as well, let's see what it looks like. So you can see over here that uh, Bruta tells memory region over here. Sorry, this is the uh, Metasploit memory region. You can see that we have multiple RX region. If I scroll down over here, let me go back. You can see the RX region starts here. It ends here. And there is no information over here about any other RX region. That's because Brutal will also hide itself and encrypt itself whenever it's going to sleep. So if I put into sleep zero, and if I go back and refresh, you can see that over here as well, the whole P information, 
But the moment I go back and I uh, put it to let's say sleep one, and if I reread, you can see that the whole region is encrypted and changed every time. If I click on refresh, you can see the RX region disappears. Let's see where the RX region is right now. If you scroll to the very top and let's search for this uh, memory address that is 1E3F1A. 1E3F1A that should be 1E3F1. Yeah, let me refresh it over here. Or let me just align it over here properly. 1E3F1A. Mm, interesting set of values here that should be uh, let me see it was one e3 f1 a right ah my bad one sec let me actually put that back to sleep zero again so that i can hunt it down it can only be hunted down when it's in sleep zero so remember that over here so let me align it go back here the rx region one e3 f1 ca my bad it's not one eight one ca so i'll type let's say sleep 10 refresh it disappears let's search for 1e3f1ca 1e3f 1e3ef1 it's still not showing up here which is interesting let me see 1e3f1ca yeah sorry remember i'm searching in 1e3ef uh, it should be over here. Perfect. You can see that it's basically in the RW region and the whole value is also encrypted in this case itself. Perfect. So this is a quick overview as to uh, what Brutal does to hide its own region into memory and you can use various other ways to inject itself into memory as well. But however, there's a lot more wa uh, what Brutal does as compared to what you are seeing over here. So let's see how we can actually use this tool to move laterally, escalate our privileges, enumerate the current system, and uh, finally gain a connection or a payload onto our main domain controller over here. So now that we've seen how Brutal can evade, evade uh, various types of detections in memory, let's take a look at the various commands that Brutal provides to provide um, different types of enumeration options as well as for lateral movement. By default, there are more than 130 commands which can be used uh, without having to create any process. If you want to see which processes can be, uh, which commands can be used to create process, you can simply type help space set malloc. And you can see that these are the various different commands which can be used over here to create a new process. You can this sh inject x command which is required for shellcode injection. The load reflect UDL command, C sharp reflection, PowerShell, Mimikatz, and Crypt Vortex. Let me go through them one by one. We have already seen what SH inject X can do. Uh, the load R command can specifically load any type of reflective DLL into memory with any kind of argument that you require, which is what it does for the PowerShell reflection as well. So the PS reflect is nothing but a wrapper for your load R in itself. The C sharp reflection, on the other hand, is purely shell code. So you have two types of C sharp reflection, one using the sharp reflect. So I'll type, let's say sharp reflect over here, space. Let's say I will go back to uh, my directory over here, which has seatbelt.exe. I'll type space slash seatbelt.exe. And whatever child process I had configured, if I, if I remember correctly, I had configured the child process over here as search protocol host, which I added into auto run for every new connection. And you can see that it spawned a new process injected into this process ID into this thread and gave me a response back in this case. Similar to this, if I type, let's say, for example, instead of sharp reflect, if I type sharp inline. Now, here is the difference between two. The sharp reflect will fork and run and it will also patch AMSI and ATW. However, if you run sharp inline, it does not require any kind of ETW or your AMSI scan buffer patching. The reason for that is because it will use hardware breakpoints to read out the instructions whenever anything tries to call AMSI scan buffer or ETW event right in this case. So if I quickly go back and attach a debugger to my notepad process here. Now let me go here and run this again. The moment I run this, it should raise, raise a single step exception, which is nothing but your breakpoint over here, as can be seen here. 
And if I scroll down, you will see our AMSI scan buffer added to our debug or our DR registers in this case. And you can see both of them have been added. And without having to perform any kind of patching, we were simply able to execute this and get our response back that we have. This is a quick uh, example as to how our evasions can take place. Another thing to notice here is that if I open, let's say, Process Hacker, and if I search for Notepad and take a look at its memory, unlike Cobalt Strike or Metasploit, where you would be able to see the .NET assemblies, in case of this, yes, I will have to open Process Hacker as an administrative process so that it can read for event sessions of a target process in this case. So I'll type Notepad. I'll go here and let's see what .NET assemblies that we get. Perfect. As you can see, it's showing the default .NET assemblies, whereas in case of your um, Cobalt Strike or any other command and control that you might use, it would show up your seatbelt.exe or whichever uh, app domain was being used by your um, C Sharp code that you loaded up. Similar to this, we can also perform PowerShell reflection. We can use the ps import command and we can specify our PowerShell path that we have. I have my PowerShell path over here, so I'll just uh, take this path up copy paste here and type powerview.ps1 and now I can run something like ps reflect I think it was get uh, yeah it's been a while since I used this so I don't recall all the commands because there are other ways to do this in brute detail but however this is how we can still use the PowerShell reflection over here which also uses a four can run technique by default, all your PowerShell code that is currently into memory will be encrypted unless until there is a need to use it by the uh, Badger itself. Now, apart from these, there are various different options that can be used by Brutal to enumerate the current system. I'll put this into sleep zero so that I can get a quick response back. I'll type window list to enumerate all the active windows into the system. You can see the process hacker, the uh, notepad.exe and a few other information. If I type, let's say, the ARP, I'll get the ARP information over here. In this case, netstat provides network statistics. Netshares command can either be used to enumerate the local system or the target system's share. The LSDR command enumerates any mounted drives on the current system. You can see my share drive that I mounted from my Linux as well over here. If I type, let's say, for example, um, the uh, let's say uh, user info command it will give me the user information and which other groups the current user is a member of whether it's a privileged or a low privileged user in this case and so on you can also enumerate the application list that you would normally see something similar to that of your uh, uh, control panel in this case and all these output are shown over here there's a lot more command that we can actually go through to enumerate the current system for example, we have the SCHT query command to enumerate scheduled tasks into local or currents or a target system. I'll type local host and full. If I don't specify full, it will only give me the metadata information. If I type full, it will also give me the whole XML of the scheduled tasks, which it will read from the target uh, location as well. Similarly, if I type SC query, local host and full, it will enumerate all the services that are currently installed onto the system. I can use the list module commands and the list module commands also takes in a uh, process ID to enumerate over here, sorry, my bad, help list underscore modules to enumerate any uh, DLLs loaded into the current or the target process, something that can be useful to identify which process loads your CLR.DLL for remote injection. You can also enumerate the drivers which are currently there uh, loaded into the system and so on. However, let's take a look at some of the more interesting parts. It has a built-in net command which can be used to enumerate the current users over here. The local sessions command return uh, which users are currently loaded and I can type net users to enumerate all the users in the current system. I can type net users vortex DC to enumerate the users in my domain controller. The DC enum command returns in which domain I am currently in and if I do an ls slash slash vortex DC slash C dollar which is my domain controller in this case I should get an access denied which is totally fine because I don't have any privileges right now. Error 5 is get last error for your access denied in this case. Now, similar to this, similar to the enumeration uh, over here that we have done, we can also enumerate any information about, let's say, I'll go Vortex DC. And over here, I'll type, let's say, administrator. It will enumerate that specific user and give me a response back. However, sometimes all this information might be a bit too little to for lateral movement or any similar artifacts. 
So what I'll do in this case is that you can select Arsenal and you can select LDAP Sentinel. Brutal provides you a built-in way to enumerate various different uh, attributes of a specific object in an Active Directory environment. I can select, for example, a user recon. And let's say I, want, I can also specify a filter what I want to search. I'll select a common name and I'll type it as, let's say, administrator. It will provide me all information about the user administrator in this case. Oh, my bad. I selected B0. It should be uh, B1 in this case because B0 is dead, the one that we killed earlier. So I'll type administrator. And you can see it has executed this specific LDAP query and given us a response back about all the attributes of that object. Let's see if we can enumerate the service principal names. I'll select all them, all of them. You can also enumerate group policy objects, group recons, and a few more. And you can see we have two different um, accounts here which are belonging to your service principal name. Let's see if we can Kerberos them. And we have the service ticket in the KRV5 encoded format here. So I'll just copy this. By default, BrewTotal provides an option over here with a tool called as KRV5 decoder. I can simply put this inside, let's say, a SVC dot tkt file or svc tkt dot hash any file that i require or txt as well and i'll type over here as svc and you can see it has converted that to a krv5 encoded ticket sorry it has basically converted the krv5 encoded ticket to something that hashcat can understand and you can later on use it for cracking as well if required now similar to this let's say you have cracked the uh, ticket and now you want to move laterally before moving laterally, you might want to enumerate uh, either local system or you can enumerate it using a lot of other built-in commands using BOF which can be executed using cough exec or a lot more over here. However, let's see how we can actually move laterally in this case. Let's say we crack the credential of our administrator. We can type make token network. Let's say I'll type uh, my domain name darkvortex.corp administrator and admin at one, two, three. And now once we have done that, uh, I'll put this to sleep one back again because I don't need quick responses anymore. I can also take a screenshot by the way, just to see what the current user is doing. It should by default go into the downloads directory over here and you should be able to view them or download it as well if required. By default, if the user has more than one desktop, it will capture every desktop that is currently there. However, let's go and see what all can be do. So over here, I'll uh, type ls vortex DC. Since we have already created a token right now, let's see if we can gain any information about the target system. Perfect. Now we can move laterally using uh, three different ways. The first one is the SC divert command, wherein without creating a new service, we can get the connection back of the target system. The second one is a built-in PS exec, which is uh, similar to that of Microsoft's PS exec, but it does a little bit more than that. We have various profiles by default in the pro pro payload profiler option. You can simply take this option over here, any uh, profile name that you have, copy that and paste the profile name here. It will automatically create that one for you so that you won't have to worry about that in this case. Similar to this, you can also capture more information over here about the target system using the WMI query command if you have a credential. So if by default, if I type WMI query, select star from win32 underscore operating system, it will by default query the current system and give you a response back. However, as you can see here, it is Windows 10 Pro and current system, which is not our domain controller. However, if I type, let's say something like, let's say uh, set underscore WMI config, I can specify a lot of other information such as like vortex DC slash root slash CIMV2 space dark vortex dot corp administrator and admin at one, two, three. And remember that all of this is happening over DCOM itself. There is no new process creation, no WMIC, no PowerShell over here. It's just raw DCOM that is being used to querying. Now, if I run the same query again, since we have configured the WMI configuration, instead of running the query locally, as you can see, it's now querying on the DC itself. We can literally run any query that you require to enumerate the target system. And there's a lot of uh, various queries that you can actually perform. Uh, we can also use the query session command if you have already created a token and specify a target system's name over here as well to enumerate if there are any active sessions on the target system. As you can see, currently only administrator is logged in. So now what we'll do is we'll use the first technique that is going to be, let's say, the SC divert command. 
because it does not create a service so we won't have to worry about anything else and what I'll do is I'll create a TCP based service here so I'll select default service executable and I'll name it as let's say IP helper v6 and IP let's say IPv4 helper service over here so that this is what it would look like when the service gets created by default and I will save this as over here in my documents directory. It will take its own few minutes to create the service in my documents directory. So what we'll do right now is we will navigate by the time it's get created. Okay, yeah, it's created right now. So what I will do is I'll navigate to my vortex DC slash C dollar. I'll go and start a quick TCP list. Now by default, every data inside the TCP is also encrypted. So I'll type, uh, let's say pivot underscore TCP, which can help me to start a list now. So I'll type pivot underscore TCP. And before that, uh, yeah, I'll just type test. Let's say I want to start a listener on the 10,000 port. So I'll type that. And before, uh, I actually have to create the payload again, my bad, because I had to change the uh, path over here. So let me just remove the TCP um, over here. Let's say TCP service, yeah, my TCP service, my bad. And let me go back and create the service again because by default it's uh, supposed to connect to localhost which is not something that I need. I want it to connect to my host which should be the IP address of 172.16.219.130. So let it the profile and add this option here. Perfect. Now it should connect back to this. We'll quickly create our service executable. It's IP helper over here v6 or let's say any other garbage value or v5 or whatever you require and let's wait till the service gets created once it has been created since we have already navigated into my uh, c drive we will upload it over there so i'll just copy this i'll type upload and the file name here and if i type ls i should see my service executable over here i'll just rename it to something that i can it would be easy for me to read. I'll just type tcp.tcp-svc.exe. Perfect. Now my file name has been created. What I'll do is I'll type the sc divert command. But before I can use this, I need a service name uh, for whose service path I'm going to modify. So I'll type sc query. Um, I'll type vortex dc space full, and I'll just hit enter. And I'll just go to my DC just to show you how it would look like to any threat hunter in this case. I'll type admin at one, two, three. And I'll go to open my event viewer here. I will go to windows logs and system. I'll clear up everything so that we know what we are going to see. As you can see, we have various services here. We have to select a service which is not a shared service because we are going to modify the service binary path. We also have to find a service which is not actively running over here in this case. So if I scroll down, let's see, we have the Active Directory web services, the router service. I would not want to modify with something that is sensitive over here in this case. So let's see, we have this one as running the application management. I'll just leave it as it is. Yeah, the app we client, we should be able to modify this. So I'll take this service name. I'll type sc divert and I'll type the target host name vortex dc the service name and the service binary path which is uh, specific to uh, the uh, system itself. So if I scroll up if I search over here as tcp svc you can see this was the service name which we renamed to. So I will just simply go over here and type the path. Now what is going to happen over here in this case is you can see that we have a quick new connection from our TCP shell. You can see the information over here. It connected back to our listener. And if I right click and load this up in an adjacent tab, you can see that the auto runs have been by default executed. And if I scroll back, let's see what happens here. If I do a refresh, you can see the service control manager, which states that the app we client has entered into a running state. But apart from that, there is no other event about the service configuration because Microsoft does not log it at all in this case. Apart from this, we can also create a new service if required. I can type psexec over here, let's say. I'll type vortex dc space my smb. My smb is my the name of my payload profile that I have here, which should start a name pipe connection onto the target system. 
So what the PSExec does is that it can also take up a configuration for your HTTP or your TCP connection as well. It will read the configuration, create a shell code, convert that shell code to a service executable which uses indirect syscalls, copy that to the target system and start a service for you. And now I can type pivot SMB space, I should get a new connection here at any point of time, vertex DC slash the name of the pipe. Remember that dot means current system. Instead of dot, if we specify a target system name, it will try to connect to the target system. Perfect. And you can see that we have a new connection. I can open this up and I can run whatever commands that I require over here, such as DC sync. If I want to run, let's say, Mimikads over here, I can run Mimikads as well. Or there's a very uh, stealthy technique to dump memory, which tends to evade uh, a lot of EDRs, including CrowdStrike, Sentinel-1, ATP, and a lot more. So I can just type shadow cloak and hit enter, which will directly uh, use indirect syscalls to read the memory of our target lsas.exe. And without dumping it to disk, it will read out the dump to our downloads directory, which you can see it's currently being downloaded over here. You can check the active status of the downloads using the list downloads command, and it should enumerate that. So apart from these, there are a lot of tools where you can actually enumerate or move laterally to the target system. You can also use the WMI exit to execute any query on the target system that you might require. And you can actually use uh, the SOX proxy to uh, enumerate a lot of information on the local system or on the target system as well. So let me take another scenario where let's assume that this is going to be our jump server in which we already have an administrative privilege. So let me uh, execute this and simulate an, exec uh, an administrative privilege here that we ha might have. As you can see, we have a new connection with star, which means it's an administrator. So now what we'll do is we'll simply uh, start crisis monitor. This command does not require any administrative privilege, but what we will be doing is we'll continuously monitor if there are any users logging in or logging off. Make note that this does not require any administrative privilege. Anyone can still use it. And I'll also enable, let's say, I'll go to my previous command and I'll just type socks underscore start, let's say 9050 on my previous payload itself. You can see the socks has been started. You can see all active socks over here. I'll simply type proxy chains, let's say nc localhost 3389-vv. We can see that I am able to connect it. So I'll type remina localhost. And now what I'll do is I'll type administrator, admin at one, two, three, and dark vortex dot corp. Now, if I go back to my another payload, you can see that, uh, yeah, over here, you can see that I have my connections active on which I started socks and on another system, I have to start crisis monitor. So the moment I log in, you should get a notification that the original user was disconnected, a new user was connected and a so on over here. And let me let it continue. And you can see that my new user is currently logging in. We can also see the information over here, which was automatically captured by your crisis monitor in this case. Now what I'll do is, the reason why I executed this new payload as an administrator is because we'll be capturing some credentials over here, or more like tokens. If I do an ls slash slash vertex dc, I should not be able to do anything because I'm just a local administrator. But with the power of local administrator, we should be able to capture some of the interesting tokens. Let's take an example for this. We have this PID. I'll type grab token and I'll steal the token for that specific uh, as you can see for process and I have stored this into my token vault. Remember that I have still not impersonated it. Similarly, if you want to impersonate something else, let's say for example, this service that we have, we can enumerate it to become anti system authority as well if required, provided that that token, that process is not privileged. You can type token vault. It should show you all the active tokens that you enumerated. Something that can be really useful on a jump server where people log in and log off a lot of times. And you might want to just capture the tokens and save them so that you don't have to worry about them logging off and you not able to extract their tokens in this case. And I'll type impersonate space zero to impersonate the administrator. And now I'll type ls and I should have a remote administrative privilege on the target system. Perfect. And we also have our flawlessly working RDP. Let me maximize it. And you can see it's, it's much better and much faster than any other SOX proxy that you might have seen at this point of time. Even though it's SOX 4, it is still working flawlessly and not as slow in this case. 
So this is a quick example as to what you can do with brute hotel. There's a lot more that can be done over here. For example, you can enumerate the systems, enumerate the threads, try to perform injection using a phantom thread technique, switch the profile of existing payloads over here, of existing connections using switch profile command, enumerate the system using file explorer over here as well, either on a local or a target system as well, just in case if required, and enumerate more over here as and how you proceed. So I think that would be all for this specific demo, which provides a brief introduction about Brute Retail. There's a lot more commands which can be used. There's a lot more things or techniques that can be used alongside this. You have the time loop command, which can be used to run every uh, a command every few seconds or minutes. You have uh, you can actually route your SOX profile to a different command and control, maybe a burnable dub command and control in this case. And uh, then you have the uh, let's say the SC information command, which can be used to enumerate the services, the SAM dump command, provided you are an administrator, you should be able to capture that information. Routes command to enumerate all the existing routes and a lot more that you can actually do, all of which are heavily documented on the website itself. So that will be all for this demo. And if you have any questions or queries, feel free to reach me back or create a list and uh, email it out to me. So cheers guys. Thanks. Bye.